Once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to this month's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. Today's webinar is on comprehensive range and wildlife management, presented by Chip Ruthven. He's a natural resource specialist with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Today's webinar is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition Incorporated, and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Chip, with that, I will pass the controls over to you, and you should be good to go. All right, thank you, Clint. I appreciate that. Uh, again, my name is, is Chip Reef, and I am with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Uh, I serve as a project leader for the uh, Panhandle Wildlife Management Areas, and I oversee all the WMAs in the Panhandle region of the state. I've been up here a little over 12 years. Prior to that, uh, for eight years, I was the assistant area manager down at the Chaparral Wildlife Management Area down in South Texas. Uh, today I'd like to go over with you all uh, comprehensive use uh, or comprehensive range management, basically using all the tools in the toolbox to manage rangelands and wildlife habitat uh, throughout the state. Uh, you look at Aldo Leopold, father of uh, modern game management. Uh, his uh, premise was that wildlife and or you could say range resources can be restored by the creative use of the same tools which have theretofore destroyed it. Axe, plow, cow, fire, and gun. I don't have the gun in this particular picture because we're really going to focus on these other uh, habitat management tools, axe, plow, cow, and fire. Uh, again, these management tools that I'm going to be discussing in this presentation, I'm going to be using the Matador Wildlife Management Area as a, as a subject matter uh, and as an example. Uh, but these uh, tools can be applied to virtually in various degrees, can be applied to all the ecosystems throughout the state. Um, start off with the cow. Most uh, rangelands in uh, Texas uh, still utilize livestock grazing, primarily cattle. Uh, for many operations, it's still their primary source of income, uh, with wildlife being secondary. Uh, and even those that have, have wildlife as a primary objective, uh, livestock cattle production is typically still a very important uh, source of income uh, off those rangelands. And if you had to pick one tool out of that toolbox, if you only had that choice to pick one tool out of that toolbox, using cattle as a management tool would probably be the best tool to choose uh, because outside of non-grazable uh, acreage such as those slopes in the background of this picture, you know, cows are going to be, your livestock are going to be able to impact uh, most of, uh, of the ground on a given piece of property. Uh, most of the habitats and ecosystems here in Texas evolved with grazing pressure, so the plants and the animals have evolved uh, with, uh, with livestock grazing. So it's an important management tool. Uh, and uh, again, I think it's probably the most important tool you can utilize on your property. Obviously, overgrazing of livestock can cause problems uh, and uh, uh, cause a regression in uh, rangeland condition and wildlife habitat. Uh, then again, the, the absence of livestock grazing in the long term can also be detrimental uh, to rangeland resources. So having a, a grazing operation is an important tool to managing rangelands, not only for livestock, but also for wildlife as well. Uh, and that may be simply, if you do are currently grazing cattle, it may be simply in just changing uh, the method in which you are grazing your cattle on your property. Uh, whether you're continuously uh, grazing, you may want to switch over to a rotational grazing system, or you may want to uh, change your stocking rate. Probably changing your stocking rate, reducing your stocking rate is the biggest thing you can do to improve uh, rangeland resources and uh, enhance wildlife habitat. Again, I'm using the Matador Wildlife Management Area as an example uh, for all of these tools. Uh, it is located in the Rolling Plains ecosystem up in the uh, southeast uh, panhandle. Uh, it's a 28,000 acre facility that is owned and operated by Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And we serve as a research and demonstration area uh, to research and demonstrate range and wildlife management practices and then disseminate that information out to the public. Uh, this is an example of the grazing strategy we utilize on the uh, WMA. Uh, again, cattle are an important part of our operation out here. Again, we are primarily focused on uh, wildlife here uh, at the Matador Wildlife Management Area, but still uh, livestock production is still an important 
uh, part of our management scheme out here because that's we realize that that's what most landowners uh, depend on livestock production for their livelihood, so it's an important part of our operation. Uh, we've even evolved over the last several years on how uh, we have uh, utilized livestock on the on the WMA. Uh, we uh, yeah. I get a little hesitant here. I'm trying to look at some of these tools on my screen. It may take me a while to kind of figure these out, but hopefully I'll get those, get them figured out here, and it'll run a little bit more smoothly. I'm sitting there, look, sitting there looking at this computer screen is not a normal activity for me. Talking into a, into a computer screen is not a normal activity for me every day. Uh, we had really started out. We started out one herd rotating through multiple pastures. We've evolved to this particular system that you see here uh, on the screen. Uh, three herds. Rotational, uh, rotational uh, grazing system. Uh, cattle will be in these pastures uh, anywhere from three to seven months uh, in rotation. Uh, and from a stocking rate standpoint, we utilize NRCS uh, stocking rates. Uh, the NRCS standard is pretty a universal standard that folks uh, tend to use. And we uh, set our stocking rate at 70% of the full stocking rate. Uh, this allows us uh, to basically have our drought contingency plan is basically built into our our, uh, our strategy year round uh, at that 70% full stocking rate. When we do have a dry year, we can typically get by without having to reduce uh, our stocking rates. We can maintain our stocking rate. Uh, may have to modify our rotations a little bit, uh, but that allows us to keep a fairly consistent stocking rate uh, in years where we produce uh, additional. Uh, Herbaceous matter, uh, we'll use that uh, for our prescribed burning uh, operations, which is, again, another tool that I'll get into here uh, a little later. Looking at some of the uh, species that uh, we have issues with uh, here in, uh, let's see if this is going to, there we go. Uh, throughout most of Texas, honey mesquite is probably one of the biggest uh, woody plants that we have problems with. Uh, on rangelands as far as uh, deterior the deterioration of range condition. Uh, a lot of the range management improvements going to deal with control or managing woody plant species uh, that have become uh, a problem and deteriorated the, the condition of rangelands. Honey mesquite uh, found over most of the uh, uh, state except extreme East Texas. That's probably one of the biggest problems uh, that we have as far as woody plant encroachment on rangelands. A native plant, it's important to the ecosystem. Uh, having a certain level of mesquite out there is highly beneficial. I mean, the mesquite beans are utilized by wildlife and livestock, uh, and uh, they're a good emergency food source. Usually when you have a good mesquite, mesquite bean crop is typically during a drought when you may need that extra forage out there for wildlife and livestock. Uh, they also provide cover for wildlife. Uh, nesting substrate, uh, species like scissor tail flycatchers will use mesquites uh, to nest in. But uh, too much mesquite on, on the range land can cause deterioration of that range land in its condition, and you need to employ some kind of control uh, mechanism. Another species that uh, a group or a group of, of, of several species that is found uh, statewide are junipers. Uh, out in the western parts of the, of the state, we have red berry juniper uh, there on the, uh, the left. Unfortunately, it is a re-sprouter, uh, which is something we have to contend with. Uh, you also get into central Texas, you have ash juniper, uh, which is not a re-sprouter, which means you, you remove the, the plant, the top of the plant, you've killed the plant. Uh, and then down there in the bottom corner, we have eastern red cedar, uh, which can be a problem over in eastern portions of the state, starting to encroach in some of our uh, riparian habitats up here in the panhandle. Fortunately, it is also not a re-sprouter, so you can manage it through uh, top removal. Oaks, uh, this pick, pick case here, we have shin oak, but it could be shin oak up here in the panhandle. It could be running live oak down on the coastal plain. Uh, it could be a post oak in the, uh, the cross timbers. Uh, again, oaks, highly beneficial to the ecosystem. I mean, a lot of wildlife depend on oak for cover. Uh, they depend, deer depend on the foliage uh, as a food resource, and of course, a wide variety of critters uh, utilize the acorns. But when oak forms dense moths dense, and dense mats, uh, suppressing herbaceous vegetation, 
you've got that rangeland deterioration that you need to want to come in and address uh, in order to improve the condition for both wildlife and livestock. Prickly pear. Uh, the larger uh, prickly pear there in the background of the picture is Texas prickly pear, or it's what a lot of folks refer to as South uh, Texas prickly pear, uh, common throughout South uh, Texas on up into portions of Central Texas. Down there in the lower right is a picture of Plains prickly pear, which is one of the species we have up here in Northwest Texas. Uh, it's a lower growing species of pear, forms dense mats, uh, and, and can become a problem. Again, prickly pear is still an important part of the ecosystem, provides uh, forage for wildlife, uh, burn the spines off it, it can provide forage for livestock, and it's also an excellent source of water uh, for wildlife as well. But densities can get to a, a level to where they need to be managed to the benefit of your rangeland resources. Some of the uh, exotic species that we have issues with, uh, they're not native, such as salt cedar. Uh, it's a problem out here uh, in West Texas. It has invaded uh, a lot of our riparian areas. It outcompetes uh, the native vegetation uh, as far as both woody and herbaceous vegetation. Other than providing a little bit of cover to wildlife, it provides no other, other value out there. And this is one of the species that we would love to completely eradicate uh, if possible, that's uh, unfortunately that is not possible, but uh, still one of those species that really need to be controlled uh, along our riparian areas uh, to increase and improve uh, rangeland condition. Other species, you know, non native species that may have issues with in the other part of the state may be a Chinese tallow tree uh, down on the mid and up, upper coast. Getting into one of the tools uh, that we use quite extensively as an excellent uh, tool to use is chemical treatments or use, use of herbicides. Uh, aerial applications are the best way and the, probably the most cost effective way to treat uh, dense stands of target vegetation, whether it be mesquite or shin oak. Uh, and uh, it's probably the most cost effective method for treating large areas densely infested with targeted vegetation that you want to uh, manage. Areas where you have light densities or areas where you might have uh, other uh, beneficial trees that may be susceptible to herbicides you want to keep, you know, such as this cottonwood uh, up here, uh, you can go in and use individual plant treatment using a backpack sprayer spraying off of an ATV and individually treat uh, target plants. In this case, it's uh, salt cedar. Looking at some of the herbicides uh, used for uh, treating some of these species. Uh, some of these names tend to get me tongue-tied, so if I botch them, please uh, forgive me. Uh, but uh, mesquite, typically the uh, primary ingredients and herbicides that are used to uh, treat mesquite are triclopyr and uh, clopyrrolids. Uh, they're two of the main ingredients used in herbicides to treat mesquite. Uh, juniper, uh, hexazinone, uh, oaks, tevithyron, prickly pear, uh, picloram, and then salt cedar. This would also include uh, Chinese uh, tallow as well. Uh, would be imazapir, are the, the chemicals typically used to uh, treat those areas. Looking at aerial applications, mesquite applications nowadays with the uh, current herbicides, you're probably looking at 35, uh, 25 to $35 an acre for treatment. Uh, juniper, unfortunately, there's no, there's, there are some uh, herbicides you can treat young junipers from a foliar application, but for uh, large, mature uh, red berry junipers, re-sprouters, uh, you really are limited to uh, IPT treatments using soil-activated uh, herbicides and uh, dense stands. It can get uh, it can get a little expensive treating dense stands. So generally, you're going to want to use IPT in low density areas for uh, for juniper. Uh, Tebuthyron uh, for treating oaks. Uh, generally, you're looking at, again, about $25 to probably $30 per acre uh, for that treatment. Uh, Picloram on the prickly pear, uh, you're probably looking at anywhere from $35 uh, to $40 per acre. And these prices can vary quite a bit uh, from year to year and from locale in the state to other locales. Uh, for salt cedar, uh, this treatment was, was, used to be fairly expensive, probably $150 to $200 an acre. The cost of herbicide has come down. Uh, it's down to probably around uh, $70 to $80 per acre 
uh, to treat those. Uh, this website down here at the bottom, uh, you can you can type in Mesquite Control Texas, and this will be one of the top uh, links it'll bring you to. Uh, it's at one of AgriLife's links uh, to their Brush Busters program. It's an excellent resource for getting information on herbicides and uh, the species that you can use use them on. Switching over to mechanical treatments. Uh, historically, uh, root plowing and chaining were used quite extensively back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s uh, to treat rangelands, especially in South Texas and in, throughout the Rolling Plains. Uh, they can still be used today. They're not quite as popular as they used to be. Uh, a lot of folks have gone over to uh, treatments such as uh, 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 aerating, using dozers and an, aer and, and, and an aerator. Uh, one thing with using these top removal methods like that, if you're using it on a resprouting species, that species is going to resprout and come back with a vengeance. So we typically use this aeration on previously chemically treated uh, mesquite uh, to improve range condition, which I'll get into a little bit later. Uh, other tools that you can use, uh, skid steers with tree shears are used quite a bit up here uh, in the panhandle and riparian areas. Uh, mulchers. Uh, are used as well. I know they're used more extensively over in East Texas. Uh, any of these uh, top removal methods on resprouting species, uh, uh, such as redberry, juniper, or mesquite, uh, you would need to treat the stump with herbicide in order to kill kill the tree to keep it back, keep it from resprouting back. Uh, if you get down to into uh, Central Texas or in portions of East Texas where you're dealing with non-resprouting species like ash juniper or eastern red cedar. Uh, these are good methods to use and fairly inexpensive methods to use. Uh, other method, uh, which would be again an individual plant treatment type method, is using an excavator with a grubbing attachment. This one is fairly po popular, especially up in our part of the world. Uh, you can use these on areas where you have light infestations that you want to deal with or in areas uh, where you have a lot of beneficial uh, trees that you want to leave from a wildlife standpoint. In this particular case down here in the lower right, uh, cottonwood gallery that is one of our major turkey roosting areas where you can go in there and just target uh, specific trees. Uh, cost per acre is going to vary quite a bit. Uh, usually excavator, dozer operator is probably going to run you $100 to $120 uh, per hour. Uh, aeration, uh, depending on the density of the trees, you might be able to get uh, two acres uh, aerated in an hour. Again, on the grubbing, it's going to vary depending on the density of, of the trees. Uh, a lot of times your operators on these mulchers can get pretty expensive, up to $250 an hour, but they're quite effective at taking down uh, some pretty good uh, significant uh, uh, vegetation. All these treatments, chemical, mechanical, they can be standalone treatments, or they can also be used in conjunction uh, with uh, other treatments. One thing to note that in conjunction with all these other treatments, livestock grazing is still going to be included as a combination in all, in all of these treatments. Prescribed fire is the last uh, uh, one uh, in the toolbox. Uh, again, most of your ecosystem in Texas have evolved with fire, natural lightning strike fires, so the plants and wildlife have evolved with periodic uh, fires coming through an, uh, an ecosystem or a given, given area. Uh, it's a great tool to use. It's a tool, though, that you must use very carefully. A lot of folks have a, uh, a fear of fire. I would say I have a great respect for fire. Uh, it takes a lot of planning, and it takes a well-trained uh, crew of uh, pyro managers uh, to uh, get you know, most prescribes done in a safe manner, but it, it can be done with the right crew and the right planning, and it's a great tool to use. It's a standalone tool if you want it to be. Uh, it can be a uh, combination tool with some of the other tools. It's a great maintenance tool for maintaining the life of chemical and mechanical treatment. Uh, assessing areas that you want to uh, target uh, for uh, use of chemicals uh, or mechanical work uh, from a brush standpoint. Aerial photography uh, nowadays has uh, is dramatically improved over the years, uh, especially if you can get aerial photography has been shot during the, uh, uh, the growing season, but even still during the dormant season, you can still separate out a lot of species. Here, this, uh, this pattern here, the typical pattern of a fairly dense stand of uh, honey mesquite. Uh, this uh, vegetation type over here, uh, 
that uh, uh, has a more of a mottled, uh, you know, a more uniform type of uh, texture to it is typically what shin oak looks like uh, from the air. Uh, you can go out and again, these light areas in, in, in here, fairly light infestations, maybe areas you do not want to target for any, any kind of uh, brush work at the, at the current time as far as chemical and mechanical treatments. Uh, but these other areas, you want to uh, treat them. You can go out and either digitize them or collect data points off the ground by foot or uh, an ATV and delineate these areas with a GPS that you want to target for treatment. Or you can simply just delineate them based off the aerial phot uh, photography uh, and then you take those shape files from a, a, a aerial spraying standpoint. You can give them to the uh, contractor and the pilot. He'll plug these into the computer. Everything's computerized nowadays for the most part. Uh, and they'll just basically go out there and fly transects back and forth, and the computer will uh, turn that sprayer on and off just to hit the areas within the areas that you have targeted for, for treatment. So you can get some fairly intricate patterns done out there. Uh, to create a more mosaic pattern out there uh, and enhance that edge effect out there for wildlife. Uh, this is a typical stand we may have uh, that we want to employ some uh, treatment. Uh, you know, some landowners this may be okay. They may not. They may say this. I don't have an issue with this level of, mos of mesquite out there. Uh, from our standpoint, we're managing for wildlife, primarily grassland wildlife. So in order to uh, enhance that. Uh, area uh, for grassland wildlife, we want to treat uh, mesquite uh, in areas like this. Uh, so we'll go out, we'll map out areas that we want to target, uh, we'll fly on uh, the appropriate herbicide uh, during the appropriate time of the year, and uh, then this is typically what we're left with. And this may be all a landowner wants to do. He's, he's reduced that mesquite canopy, the influence of that mesquite tree, he's increased the uh, Herbaceous productivity under the un, under those canop old dead canopies uh, for both wildlife and livestock production, uh, and uh, that may be as far as you want to go. You know, those, you know, from a grassland restoration standpoint, we don't want those standing dead skeletons out there because they're going to stand out there uh, for for many many years. But uh, just increasing herbaceous vegetation is is a goal. This may be uh, may be sufficient. Uh, again, you know, beforehand you may have been looking at a 70% stocking rate out here, may have been uh, one cow to 60 acres. Uh, through treatments like this throughout a pasture, you may have actually uh, moved that down to a cow uh, to 50 acres, potentially. Uh, another view of, of what these stands look like after uh, uh, being sprayed. Uh, her the herbicides are getting better and better as new herbicides are developed. Uh, but you still uh, may not be able to get 100% kill on your mesquite trees. You can see flagging on a few of these mesquite trees out there uh, that weren't completely killed, and that's fairly typical. If you can get over a 90% kill rate, uh, you've done done very well. Uh, and some of the herbicides that are on the market nowadays, and some that are being developed, currently being developed, uh, you can probably pretty consistently get over that 90% rate. A lot of these herbicides for mesquite. Uh, are fairly specific to mesquite, and they will, you can retain a lot of your more preferred brush species out there, essentially unscathed during the herbicide treatment. Uh, here's a uh, hackberry tree uh, that is essentially, you know, unharmed during, the, uh, during the, 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 the treatment on the mesquite. They may get burned back a little bit, but they will, they will come back, and you can maintain those, those beneficial species out there such as hackberry, lope bush, et cetera, those other species you want to leave out there uh, from a wildlife standpoint. Uh, again, from a, uh, from, a, uh, from a wildlife management standpoint, again, you, know, you may have increased that herbaceous vegetation out there, maybe your primary goal, and you're happy with that situation there. Uh, however, from a, from a quail hunt standpoint, I would not really be crazy about throwing my dog out there and going quail hunting. Although you may have improved that, that herbaceous level for, for quail, it's still not going to be a, a great place to be uh, trying to follow a bird dog through quail hunting. Also, from a livestock standpoint, cattle are still going to have uh, some degree of difficulty navigating between those dead mesquites uh, to, uh, to forage. Uh, so you may want to go a step further. 
uh, which is what we do in, ma in many cases, not all cases, but many cases, especially where we're wanting to restore grassland habitats, uh, and, and that is to employ that mechanical uh, treatment. Here we use uh, we use a, a dozer pull with an aerator. Uh, you've got different size aerators, double drum, single drum, basically drive over. You allow those, those standing dead mesquites to stand out there for probably three or four years to get some rot in them, so they will push over easily with the blade of the, of the dozer. Aerator chops up that mesquite, gets it down at ground level. Uh, the added soil disturbance by the aerator will actually stimulate herbaceous vegetation. And uh, with a little cooperation uh, from Mother Nature uh, in the rainfall department, you can go to stands like this. Uh, stands of, of, of native grass. Uh, this is, uh, they, these, these grasses have come back from native stock, native seed sources. There's no, no supplemental seeding done here. Uh, this stand is primarily dominated by Plains bristle grass and Arizona cotton top, which are two preferred grasses from a grazing standpoint, and they're great grasses from a wildlife standpoint. In the background, again, you can see some sprayed mesquite that is yet to be aerated. Again, you can see those woody trees, uh, packberries, et cetera, that have been retained in that stand uh, following the herbicide treatment. And when you're doing the aerating, you just drive around those trees when you're doing the aerating so you can keep those trees out there uh, on the landscape for the, be for the benefit of, of wildlife. And again, you've further increased your carrying capacity out here for livestock. You went from 60 acres, maybe a, a cow to 60 acres, to a cow to uh, 50 acres, maybe now you may have gone down to a cow to uh, 40 acres or 35 acres in this uh, particular uh, situation. Of course, that's going to vary quite a bit depending on uh, what part of the state you're in. Uh, shin oak, uh, and this could apply to running live oak down the coast. They form these dense stands, usually on sandy soils. Uh, most of these habitats are typically uh, tall grass prairie habitats, which is kind of unusual out in the western part of the drier part of the state, uh, but those beneficial grasses are still out there. Uh, little blue stem, there's a little blue stem plant, there's another little blue stem plant. Little blue stem, big blue stem tend to dominate these uh, vegetation types, uh, but uh, once the shin oak takes hold, it suppresses that herbaceous vegetation, it's still out there hanging on, it just needs to be released by reducing that influence of the shin oak. Again, fly on, uh, take your thyr on, and uh, these sandy soils respond very quickly to these herbicide treatments in many cases. Usually in one to two growing seasons, you can go from thin stands of shin oak to nice stands of, of tall grass prairie. Uh, again, out in our part of the world, it's primarily little blue stem and big blue stem. Again, we've left some shin oak out there uh, from a wildlife standpoint for those of wildlife uh, like uh, mule deer, white-tailed deer, bobwhite quail, lesser prairie chicken that depend on that shin oak uh, as part of their, their habitat. Again, just looking at the map of the Matador WMA and the mesquite spraying we've been able to accomplish over the years. This is, you know, this is basically uh, brush sculpting mesquite at a 28,000 acre level. Uh, and spraying is done over multiple years. And a lot of that has to do with the funding that we have available to actually do uh, the mesquite spraying. You know, in 2005, we only had enough funding to spray 200 acres of mesquite. 2006, we didn't have any money to spray mesquite, so we didn't spray any mesquite in 2006. 2008, we were able to get enough funding to where we could spray a little over 1,000 acres. Uh, 2015, we did not spray any mesquite. We actually had the funding to spray mesquite, uh, but the mesquite was not in the, the proper vegetative physiological state uh, in order uh, for the spraying to really affect the high mortality rate on the mesquite, so we decided uh, to postpone uh, that spraying uh, until 2016. And this summer, we have this area up here targeted uh, for spraying in uh, this summer, uh, if the weather holds. Uh, again, another good benefit of actually stay staggering this out over multiple years is uh, that you're going to have varying varying levels of plant succession coming back into these areas over multiple years, which is, is, should overall increase plant diversity, which is going to overall increase uh, your wildlife diversity. As you can see, mesquite's pretty well uniformly scattered and a universal problem we have on this particular uh, WMA, and that's uh, probably not uncommon on a lot of, a lot of areas in Texas. Uh, Shin oak, uh, found in one of the deep sandy areas. We don't have a whole lot of that habitat type on the WMA. 
begin uh, spraying uh, uh, blocks of, of, of shin oak, the denser stands of shin oak, strip spraying shin oak uh, over here on the, uh, the far east end of the WMA. Again, targeting those dense stands, uh, leaving the lighter density stand of shin oak out there to, uh, again, increase overall range condition for both wildlife and livestock. Uh, prickly pear is something we've just really gotten into uh, being able to, to manage prickly pear. That plains prickly pear uh, can have a, is a severe problem for us out here in spots. It can forage large, dense mats of nothing but prickly pear. You do get grass coming up between the prickly pear, but you know, quail hunters and dogs they don't want to go anywhere near it. You know, cattle really don't like getting out there in it. So it's an issue that we uh, we need to address. We actually use our, our prickly pear spraying in combination with our prescribed burning activities. An uh, area where we've done a, a prescribed burn, uh, we can get out there and it's lower growing prickly pear, which is difficult to see. Uh, after we've burned an area, we can go out there and effectively see the areas we need to target uh, for spraying, uh, get those areas mapped. Uh, prescribed fire itself, a real hot summer fire may actually kill prickly pear. Usually, uh, winter, uh, late winter, early spring fires, which most uh, is the time of year when most people burn, uh, you're not going to you're damage the prickly pear, but you won't kill it. Uh, but if you get enough damage to the prickly pear by the fire, you can actually cut your rate of herbicide in half uh, that you apply uh, to the prickly pear. Uh, anyway, we'll go in there and target these areas uh, after prescribed burns where we've got severe damage to the pear. We use the half rate to get the prickly pear control where we get very little damage to the prickly pear. Uh, we'll use the, use the full rate. And again, targeting those areas that are just, you know, you're looking at 70 to 80 percent coverage of prickly pear in many cases. Uh, mechanical treatments, uh, these green, uh, green and yellow polygons over on the eastern side of the area are upland sites. They're areas we want to, we want to intensively manage uh, for grassland habitat, for grassland wildlife. Uh, these are areas that have been sprayed, uh, mesquite areas that have been sprayed, and we've gone back in and used the aeration. Uh, these stifled areas down here uh, along the uh, Middle Peace River are in our riparian corridors. Uh, there are areas uh, where we have major turkey roosts. Uh, where we've gone in and are and plan to go in uh, and uh, grub uh, species such as uh, red berry juniper mesquite, uh, even some salt cedar uh, out from underneath the canopies uh, of cottonwoods to enhance our, our uh, roosting areas for, uh, for wild turkey. Uh, this map's a little difficult to read, looking at the, the color patterns don't, didn't match up real well, but all the red you see on this map uh, plus this uh, purple over here in the uh, far uh, left-hand corner of the screen. Everything in red outside outside of these areas, these little this little checkerboard pattern down here. But all the other areas in red were actually burned during wildfires during the summer of 2011. Uh, we've actually this area in purple over here uh, on the uh, uh, far western end. We actually came in and actually reburned that again. Uh, as a maintenance burn uh, this past winter. Uh, looking at some of these other areas, uh, this area in here was burned uh, last year, uh, or, or I'm sorry, two years ago. Uh, this uh, current year, we burned this area in here. We had area, uh, areas two or three years ago uh, where we burned areas up in here, uh, down here as well. So we use a, a, a checkerboard pattern of, of burning uh, throughout the uh, uh, the, the management area. Uh, with that reduced stocking rate in wet years, we can produce the extra fuel to actually get out there and apply that prescribed fire uh, on the landscape uh, as, as a management tool. Uh, during the last couple of years, we've, been, we've had wet years, had good forage productivity, and we've burned approximately 4,000 acres each year over the last two years. Uh, under a normal rainfall year, we may only have enough forage out there to uh, uh, burn 2,000 acres, and in drought years, we may not have forage out there uh, to spare uh, for prescribed fire at all. Uh, so, because uh, again, we were utilizing that, that cattle is one of the primary tools we're using. Uh, so we, uh, during those dry years, a lot of that forage is going to be going to those cows so we can maintain that tool out there on the landscape. Down here in the, uh, the southeast corner down here where you see this checkerboard pattern, uh, that's where we're doing some of our research 
uh, and looking at a, a relatively new tool, at least in our part of the, of the uh, 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 South Plains, uh, looking at uh, past burning and grazing as a management tool, uh, which essentially we've got the, these areas checkerboarded up into little burn units uh, that will burn one or two of those plots a year. Uh, within the pasture, no cross fencing, just one pasture, those blocks set up in there uh, will burn a patch uh, in the year under continuous livestock grazing. Uh, this uh, method is used quite readily over in Tallgrass Prairie, uh, especially in the 35-inch rainfall belt and greater, uh, but it does seem to be applicable to varying degrees in, in lighter rainfall belts. We're at about 21, 22 inches of rainfall here. Uh, we're still trying to see what may be the best stocking rate to stock these areas at to see range improvement. Uh, but the theory behind it is you go out and burn one of these patches, uh, you're going to put some damage on the prickly pear, and livestock will will graze or browse on that prickly pear immediately following the fire to add a little control to the prickly pear. Uh, but they like this new green growth on these burned areas, and they will heavily utilize them uh, during that first growing season following the fire. Uh, the next year you burn another patch, uh, the cows will rotate over to that other patch, allowing the patch that you previously burned uh, to recover, and you may have a fire return interval of every uh, four, five, or six years, uh, depending on the number of patches you've got out there, uh, but that would be the ideal uh, time frame, and basically just keep that cycle going, and basically this mimics historic natural fires and historic natural grazing by bison. But it's another tool that landowners can potentially use uh, to manage rangelands on their their property. Uh, one other tool that Aldo Leopold didn't have back in the day, but we do today, is uh, biological control on, especially on on invasive species. Uh, salt cedar, native to Eurasia and North Africa, uh, brought in and uh, as probably as an ornamental as erosion control has invaded many western rangelands, not just here in Texas, uh, but in their native haunts they have a, a native beetle that feeds upon salt cedar and basically keeps it in check. Uh, USDA started to experiment with this beetle about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, AgriLife Extension has also been heavily involved in developing uh, the introduction of the salt cedar beetle to, as a biological control agent for salt cedar. Uh, the Matador WMA was used as a site beginning in 2008 uh, to release beetles, and uh, very for, for the first several years, I mean, throughout the from the from the northern Panhandle down to the Rio Grande and the Big Bend, uh, they've released different varieties of beetles uh, based on the uh, longitude that they're found in their native haunts. Beetles from uh, from Uzbekistan uh, seem to be best for the Panhandle. Uh, Permian Basin type area, beetles from Crete tends to be the best variety. Down along the Rio Grande, beetles from Tunisia tend to be the best variety. Uh, beetles that were released in the Panhandle in 2008 uh, uh, and, and a few years earlier, uh, they persisted, but they really did. We didn't really see any significant defoliation of salt cedar. And then some, something happened in 2012. Uh, the beetles took off, and they were defoliating huge areas of salt cedars all over the Panhandle. Uh, we had good defoliation again uh, in, in 2013. Uh, this is typically what it looks like, and the beetles only select for salt cedar. They do not attack any other uh, native uh, plants. They solely feed on salt cedar. Again, we had good defoliation in 2012, 2013. Probably had something to do with the drought at the time, because since then, 2014, uh, 14, 15, and in this spring, we're seeing very little beetle activity. So hopefully, uh, once uh, those uh, we get the right conditions again, the beetles we know they're out there. They'll come back with a vengeance and provide a very good control agent. Uh, and a control agent doesn't cost anything uh, on uh, on salt cedar. Assessing the impacts of uh, your habitat management and range management activities uh, on your property. You've got an area you want to apply uh, one or more of these practices on. Uh, you want to assess, you know, what, what kind, what good am I doing on the landscape there? Probably the, the the best way to do it would be do vegetation trans text, vegetation plots, look at cover of woody plant species, cover of herbaceous plant species, frequency occurrence of of, of herbaceous uh, plant species. But that takes a lot of time, and most people do not have time to do that. Uh, you may be able to just go down to looking at 
two, three, four of your more beneficial species that you may want to monitor uh, on a site. You may take, take Plains bristlegrass, which is widely distributed over most of the state. Uh, it's a very palatable uh, grass from a livestock standpoint, provides good cover for wildlife, a food resource uh, for wildlife. And even on moderately grazed, even somewhat heavily grazed sites, plains bristlegrass does tend to, to persist on those sites. The plants may already exist, but looking at monitoring those plants to say a few vegetation plots, you may be able to see is it increasing or decreasing in relation to what I'm doing on that landscape. Another, uh, another good species uh, to utilize may be Cytos gramma. Again, another widely distributed. Uh, Grass species uh, here uh, in Texas, uh, again, midgrass, highly preferred by livestock, excellent cover source for, uh, for wildlife, uh, tends to persist on most rangelands out here, even under moderate to even some overgrazing type situations. So again, monitoring uh, Cytos gramma, seeing is it increasing or decreasing based on what I'm doing out there on the landscape. Uh, other species such as your tall grasses, such as big blue stem. Uh, your, a lot of your tall grasses, especially in the western part of the state, uh, tend to get grazed out fairly quickly under, under uh, long-term heavy grazing uh, scenarios. Uh, so you may want to you know, use big blue stem. You may, may not have any big blue stem on your property, but you may want to look and see if you start seeing big blue stem coming back on your property in response to uh, the activities that you're doing uh, on the uh, on the landscape. Another, another good tall grass species that's fairly uh, distributed over most of the state is Indian grass. Again, if you start seeing Indian grass increasing, uh, you're, you've probably got a pretty good stocking rate out there and those habitat management tools you're utilizing, whether it's chemical, mechanical, uh, or prescribed fire, are improving the range condition out there, which is going to increase your carrying capacity for wildlife species. Uh, whether it's bobwhite quail or white-tailed deer or livestock. You may pick a fork. Uh, this is Engelman daisy. Uh, it's, it's Again, it's widely distributed over most of the state, extremely common in the hill country, uh, fairly very common up here in many parts of the panhandle. Uh, it's a highly preferred fork for livestock and a highly preferred for, for wildlife. Uh, you drive down through the hill country, see lots and lots of Engelman daisy on the roadsides. If you look across the fence, in most cases you're going to see no Engelman daisy out there because it's been grazed out by either livestock or deer or other wildlife species. So it's an, a good indicator species. You start seeing an increase or you start seeing the presence of Engelman daisy uh, out there uh, on the rangeland, on your rangelands, uh, then you're, you're probably making some good progress on improving the range improvement. Uh, out there. Here on the Matador WMA, this is one of the species we look at just from an anecdotal uh, observation. Uh, in 2004, pretty much the only place you saw Engelman daisy out here was on the highway right away out here right in front of the, of the management area. It occurred out on the management area, but it was very sparse. Uh, today, it's, it's a fairly common uh, thing to encounter Engelman daisy out on the management area. Probably the easiest way uh, to look at, at and monitor the, and assess the impact you're putting on a given piece of property are photo points. Uh, you go out, take two T-posts, drive them into the ground fairly close to one another, uh, paint one T-post a different, the top of the T-post a different color, we paint them yellow. Uh, that's, that's the post from which we place the camera. Uh, place your camera, put your other T-post in the bottom, bottom center of your frame and take a photograph. Uh, we take photographs four times a year, uh, but you can do this by just simply taking one photograph a year. I take that photograph during the peak or the latter part of the growing season, maybe in July or August, and take it at the same time of year each year uh, if you're just going to use uh, one photo point. Uh, but you want to put these photo points out in areas where you're going to maybe want to apply chemicals, where you want to apply mechanical treatments, where you want to apply prescribed fire, or maybe in areas where the only tool you're really going to be using, utilizing out there is grazing by livestock. So again, over a long-term period of time, you can see how the influence of those management tools are influencing the range conditions you have out here. This is a site here on the Matador WMA. As you can see, a lot of brush, that's a, there's a 
dense stand of shin oak here uh, over on the far western horizon of uh, that dark green is uh, honey mesquite. We've gone in there over again. This picture was taken in July 2009. Uh, we had sprayed some mesquite in 2007, but again, 11 and 14 mesquite spraying over several years. Uh, sprayed that shin oak in 2012. Uh, we did a lot of aeration over there in the far horizon up there, so you notice that that solid green over there was sprayed and then aerated. And then in uh, March of 2015, we ran a prescribed fire through there. And this is all along, we're using a lot of this pastures incorporated into our rotational grazing system out here. And so in 2009, it looked like that with all those multiple tools applied to the landscape. That's what it looked like in July 2015. Uh, so we've, you know, it's obviously we've made significant strides in, in enhancing grassland habitats out there. Uh, a few other of our photo points out here. Here's a photo point up in, in a little bit more of our, our rough break type country. Up here on these ridge tops, uh, you have a little bit uh, better soil condition up here, uh, a little bit better from a productivity standpoint. A lot of slope out there, a lot of ungrazable acreage out there uh, for cattle uh, where you see that red berry juniper out there. Uh, these areas of mesquite, a little bit better productive soils. Again, we've gone in, gone in, and uh, this picture was taken in 2009. I think this picture was probably taken just a week or two before we actually went out uh, and sprayed it. Uh, and then we ran a prescribed fire through here in, uh, again, March of 2015. And our, well, here's what it looks like in May. This is a year after the, uh, 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 the mesquite uh, treatment spraying. And again, open that canopy up significantly. Actually, we realized out there we got a lot more red berry juniper out there than we thought we did. Uh, we do have some issues you can see down here. Got some issues with some prickly pear uh, out there uh, as well. And again, again, in 2015, we ran a prescribed fire through this area. Uh, and that's what it looked like in July 2015. So this is four or five months after uh, we ran a fire through there. Uh, actually, you can utilize fire those dead mesquite skeletons. You get the fire hot enough and you get enough rot in those mesquite trees, instead of having to aerate it, uh, you can actually burn down a lot of those standing dead mesquites with fire. We've got uh, some control on that red berry juniper. Those red berry junipers aren't dead. They're top killed. They will re-sprout. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would not hesitate and I would love to kick a bird dog right out there uh, during the peak of quail season. And, uh, you know, again, increasing that forage production for livestock, as well as enhancing that uh, area for grassland wildlife, such as bobwhite quail and mule deer, which is another one of the species that we manage for out here. Uh, another area, again, dense stand of mesquite. You know, some folks, you got a little area right here in the, in the middle here. Uh, you, may, you, may, you might want to leave that area untreated as far as, uh, as, far as a herbicide treatment. Uh, for our standpoint, again, we were wanting to go strictly for enhancing grassland habitat in this particular area, so we did spray the whole uh, whole area. Uh, this is May 2006. Uh, we sprayed it uh, in uh, 2009. Uh, came back in with prescribed fire. So here's here's this July 2009. I'm sorry, we sprayed it in 2008. So this is a year after it had been sprayed. Uh, again, dramatic improvement out there of the range condition. For some folks, that may be good enough. I'm just going to, you know, utilize uh, uh, cattle out there as a management tool uh, in the short term right now. We came through, ran a prescribed fire through there in uh, 2015 during the dormant season. Uh, and again, another area I'd love to kick a bird dog out uh, out there uh, in the middle of middle of January. Uh, got some uh, control, measure of control from the fire on the red berry juniper, but we've enhanced the uh, uh, the grassland habitats out there and increased the carrying capacity for wildlife and livestock. This is taken from the same vantage point. It's actually looking over into an adjoining pasture. Uh, again, it was sprayed uh, at the same time. Uh, you can see back here in this uh, upper uh, right-hand corner there, it almost looks black. That was an extremely dense stand of mesquite. We did we did come in and do some aeration work in there. Uh, the fence line right here, uh, everything on the right side of the fence line uh, uh, is basically the same treatment that was applied to the previous slide. Uh, on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side over here, 
this area was actually subjected to a prescribed fire in, I'm, not, I'm sorry, it was subjected to a wildfire uh, in 2011. So we had a wildfire in 2011. Uh, we started some aeration in 2014 out there. So other than the wildfire, there had been no other fire applied uh, out here. And uh, this is what it looks like uh, in this past summer, July 2015. Down here you can see see a little strip there back in the, in the back there that uh, we've gotten aerated. And we're, we're right in the middle of the process of getting that little area aerated down there again to, to enhance uh, those grassland habitats. Uh, riparian areas, this is along the Middle Pease River. Uh, the uh, lighter green vegetation uh, down along the river there is salt cedar. Uh, we sprayed it back in 2009. Uh, back here in the uh, far uh, left-hand corner here, that area was actually part of the WMA that burned during a wildfire in 2011. Uh, this didn't stand a mesquite right here. was sprayed in 2014. Uh, and this area here in the, uh, the foreground here, mid, or mid foreground, uh, you can see all that red berry juniper in there. It went in in uh, uh, July, actually June of 2015, and we went in there and grubbed out red berry juniper, mesquite, and salt cedar from that area. And that's what it looked like last summer in July. Uh, 2015. You can see the impact of the prescribed fire, I mean, of the wildfire back there on uh, uh, herbaceous vegetation, uh, the impact of the spraying of the mesquite and the salt cedar, and the impact of the grubbing out there as well. Uh, just show you the, 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 the impacts of wildfire. Here's in some of our more rough break country, dense stands of juniper and, and uh, Honey mesquite, uh, a lot of prickly pear out there as well. Uh, wildfire came through here in June of 2011, and, and uh, that's what it looked like in July 2011. Uh, very hot fire, and you can actually recreate this conditions through a prescribed fire. It takes a lot of planning and a well-trained crew to do it, but you can you can do it. You know, if you're willing to sacrifice a couple years worth of livestock grazing out there. And uh, a couple, you know, and some, and some uh, loss of wildlife habitat in the short term, uh, you can mimic these types of uh, treatments. Because again, unfortunately, right now there's not a good, effective area of foliar spray to treat mature uh, red berry juniper. At least not that I'm aware of. I know some are in the, in the development. You know, once we get a good foliar spray that will uh, will kill red berry juniper without uh, too much damage to the other uh, resources out there. We've been able to make a lot more headway on, uh, on juniper control. Anyway, this is July 2011. Uh, this is what it looked like back in July 2015. Uh, we'll actually try and go, you know, since all those volatile fuels have been removed, we'll try and get back in there and uh, apply a prescribed fire to this area probably around 2018. Go in there and retop kill a lot of these uh, mesquites and, and red berry junipers. Here's a red berry juniper that's re sprouting. Uh, if you look at some of these other plants over here, 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 there's one there, there's one there. Uh, that's Vinifedra. Uh, they responded very positively to that wildfire. They came back, uh, almost all the plants came back. We didn't have any, we observed very little mortality on Vinifedra, which is again another great browse species uh, for deer and cattle we utilize as well. Uh, this is an area where we did a lot of, where we did some juniper IPT. Uh, Prime of the vegetation out in the foreground is, is redberry juniper and uh, skunkbush sumac. Skunkbush sumac, one of the preferred browse species we want to retain out there. Uh, went out there, light density of redberry juniper, treated them over two or three years. It's, it's amazing how you go out and think you got them all treated. Next year you'll see a bunch of green trees out there that you missed. So you have to go back out there and uh, retreat them. Uh, and that's what that area looked like in, in July uh, 2015. Uh, another riparian area along the South Tees River, or the Tongue River. Uh, there's some there's cottonwoods back here uh, in uh, the uh, background. Again, one of our major turkey roosting areas that's been invaded by redberry juniper, but also mesquite and salt cedar. Uh, we came in with a grubber. We removed all the redberry juniper, salt cedar, and mesquite, and retained all the cottonwoods. We retained all the hackberries, the chittim woods, and the soapberries, those browse species that are beneficial to wildlife. Uh, and, and, and serve as roosting trees for, uh, for our turkey. 
Uh, we came in, we did that in, in, in summer of 2014, that following winter of 2015. Uh, well, we'd gone in in 14, we, we grubbed it and we root raked all the brush into piles. We burned those piles during the winter of uh, 2015. And that following summer, that's what that area looked like that following summer. Again, increase the carrying capacity out there for all resources. Another area I'd love to kick a bird dog out into uh, during current quail season. One last series, of, uh, a couple last series of slides. Here's another area, again, treated uh, mesquite. Uh, that was uh, treated, actually treated in 2014. Uh, we ran a prescribed fire through there this, this past March. Uh, that's what it looked like uh, in July 2015, that following uh, uh, winter this past spring, March 2016, we ran a prescribed fire through there, uh, and that's what that pasture looked like earlier this week. I think I took that photograph on on Monday. Uh, again, part of our cattle rotation, uh, you know, cattle this this pasture will get full growing season rest. Cattle will come back in late in the fall uh, to calve out in this particular pasture uh, next winter. Uh, use of just fire alone in riparian. Uh, uh, Floodplain of the Middle Pease River, uh, dominated by mesquite, some uh, some redberry juniper, uh, some uh, uh, salt cedar as well. Uh, this is October 2014. We ran a prescribed fire through there in, in March of 2015. Uh, that's what it looked like one month after we ran a prescribed fire through there. A little too early to tell what's still alive and what's dead, as uh, so most of these deciduous trees had not leaked out that for the year. But then. July that same year, you can actually get a, get a lot of uh, improvement and in, in control of woody species just by using prescribed, prescribed fire alone. I think this is the last set I've got here. Again, riparian area along the, along the Middle Tease River. Uh, the darker green out there is salt cedar. Uh, the light green out there is mesquite. This is May 2012. This is right about when we got that good outbreak uh, or good infestation, desirable infestation of salt cedar beetles. Uh, this is what it looked like in July 2013. Uh, you can see this little area down here is totally defoliated. That was actually defoliated in 2012. And it looks like we actually got some mortality on those salt cedar trees in 2012. The rest, everything you see out there is brown is defoliation by salt cedar beetles during July of 2013. Uh, ran a fire through there. Again, it was in late winter, early spring of 2015. And that's what that area looks like that following July. Uh, burned down a lot of that standing dead uh, vegetation. A lot of that grass coming back in along that uh, floodplain of the Middle Tees River is switchgrass. Uh, another excellent forage grass for livestock, a great uh, cover and food resource uh, for uh, wildlife as well. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Uh, for those folks that, are, that, that, that want, uh, would like technical assistance uh, in managing their properties, uh, you know, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, uh, this, we have the state is divided up into, into eight wildlife districts. Within those districts, uh, we have multiple wildlife biologists. Each biologist is assigned uh, a suite of counties. So each county in the state has a Texas Parks and Wildlife Biologist uh, assigned to it. Uh, those district biologists, one of their primary functions is to provide technical assistance uh, to private landowners. Uh, also within each one of those eight uh, wildlife districts, we have a uh, technical guidance biologist. Uh, some districts have two technical wildlife biologists. They're usually a senior level staff member. Uh, they cover the whole district and uh, one of the, their primary purpose is again to provide uh, technical assistance uh, to uh, private landowners in managing uh, their property, their rangeland resources uh, based on their specific goals uh, and objectives. And then we've got our wildlife management areas that are scattered throughout the state. Uh, we've got several of them that are research and demonstration areas like the Matador WMA uh, located in, in, in other uh, eco -reg regions, the Kerr, uh, the Chaparral WMA, the Gus Engling WMA, uh, just to name a few, but we have them down on the coast as well. Uh, Piney Woods, Northeast Texas, uh, Trans-Pecos, 
Uh, Elephant Mountain is, is one of the primary research and demonstration areas out there in that part of the state uh, where we employ these types of practices on our own properties uh, so landowners can come out and actually see what the use of those habitat tools, Aldo Leopold recommended, uh, how they're going to influence the ecosystem out there, the betterment of overall range health and improving productivity of wildlife uh, and livestock. Of course, uh, AgriLife Extension has wildlife specialists scattered throughout the state that can also provide uh, technical assistance uh, uh, in, in conjunction with their, you know, assisting their county agents in applying that. Uh, and the NRCS also has wildlife biologists scattered throughout the state. And then our NRCS also has range conservationists and soil conservationists assigned at the county level uh, as well that can assist landowners in managing the range, rangeland resources on their property. Uh, NRCS FSA also has cost share programs uh, to help landowners to implement some of these practice, practices. Uh, also, even with Parks and Wildlife, we have uh, some cost share programs as well that we can use to assist landowners uh, in improving uh, the habitats uh, on their rangelands. Uh, with that, I, I thank you all for you all's attention, and I'd be more than happy to open it up to questions if we have time. We do, Chip. <clears throat> Thanks for the presentation. We've got three questions so far. I would encourage anybody, if you still have questions, post them up, and we'll we'll get to them in the order they come in. First question we have says, I have a small property, about 50 acres, and it's dense with ash juniper. These provide an abundant habitat for small birds of all sorts. If I remove these invasive bushes, will I hurt my plant, my bird population? Uh, it, it's a possibility. It depends on, because you do have some birds that are dependent uh, upon that uh, juniper. Uh, the food, so golden cheek warbler is the first one that comes to mind, which is a federally listed uh, species. Uh, so, you know, in turn, you could be harming some bird species, uh, but uh, by, you know, removing that dense brush and creating a more of a herbaceous component to the, uh, to the area out there, you're going to benefit other species. Okay. This person has a small mesquite, uh, has some small mesquite that they want to kill, but they're very close within a couple feet to a much larger mesquite that they want to save. Is there a safe method to do this with herbicide, or is mechanical method the best? Uh, if it's in, in really in close proximity uh, to the mesquite they want to want to keep, I would probably try uh, some kind of mechanical method. Uh, you get those mesquite trees, there may be enough you know, connect, connectivity of that root system down there, depending on how close it is to that other mesquite, uh, that I'd be a little leery to use uh, a herbicide, so I'd probably use some kind of mechanical method for removing those undesirable mosquitoes. Okay, and then among cottonwood, hackberry, cedar elm, and post oak, which would be the preferred roosting tree or trees for turkey? Uh, cottonwood probably, is probably going to be your primary roosting tree uh, for turkeys, uh, especially in our part of the world. Uh, over in the more eastern part of the states, uh, they'll probably you know, they'll, they'll use a variety of other trees, but cottonwood's probably the primary uh, roosting tree uh, for turkeys. Uh, but they'll use other parts of the state. You know, they'll use pecan. Uh, they'll use uh, they'll use oaks, uh, live oaks, probably even post oaks. Uh, the, any, any sizable tree that provides uh, the limb structure for them to be able to fly up into and, and roost upon, they'll utilize. Okay. Next question says. I have a 177-acre place near Snyder that was burned in a wildfire, wildfire in 2011. Since then, I'm being overtaken with what they believe is catclaw mimosa on a 100-acre CRP portion of the property. What's the best treatment option other than spike 20P uh, because the spike is too costly? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure what other herbicides uh, might work. That's where you know, the Brush Busters uh, website might be able to help you out there, probably your local uh, uh, NRCS uh, agent would probably help you out on, this, on any other herbicides that might work uh, on on there. Uh, to be honest with you, I think it's probably going to you're probably hard pressed to find a cheaper option uh, than uh, than using uh, that tetrathyron uh, on uh, on that uh, cat claw acacia. Uh, you may find some cheaper herbicides. I don't. I'm, I'm not familiar enough with some of the other herbicides on uh, how they will actually impact. Uh, Catclaw mimosa, uh, but uh, mechanical methods. Uh, you know, if, if you're willing to do it, you could go out there and you know, since catclaw mimosa is a fairly 
a spindly, low-growing type shrub. Uh, if you were willing to do it, you could possibly go out there with the tractor and just shred strips out there uh, to get a measured control on that cat claw, cat claw mimosa, which is going to, in the short term, enhance your uh, herbaceous communities out there. Of course, the cat claw acacia will re-sprout, but it will take several years for it to get back to its uh, original height. So uh, periodic shredding uh, may be an option for you. All right. Looks like that's all the questions we have right now. A couple quick things I wanted to remind you all of. This webinar will be archived in the next week or so. I posted the link up. It has some funny numbers next to it. I'm not sure where they came from. But um, if you follow that link, you'll be able to see this webinar in a, in a couple weeks as well as all the other webinars that we've done in the past. Our next webinar is going to be held on July 21st. It's going to be on property evaluation basics, reading the land, presented by Shane Kiefer with Plateau Land and Wildlife. Um, Chip, I believe that's all I have. Uh, I would encourage everybody to fill out the survey at the end. When you close it, a survey will pop up. That will help us for future webinars, ideas, and let us know how we did on this one. So, Chip, do you have anything else to close? No, nope. appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Thank you all for joining us.